I want you to get to know your perspective on the college. And I will be honest and tell you that I do regret sincerely the impact of COVID-19 in, in slowing the development of some of those relationships. So I do appreciate you taking the time just to connect through this medium so that we can have somewhat of a conversation. I'm coming to you right now from Blacksburg, so understand that we have critical constituents, not just here in Blacksburg, but also at the Marion DuPont Scott Equine Medical Center there in Leesburg, at the new Animal Cancer Care and Research Center in Roanoke, and also colleagues that are greatly appreciated at the Abram Godolsky Veterinary Center there in College Park, Maryland. So as I come to you and seek to connect with you, know that uh, we have great appreciation for both your time. You're going to see me cover quite a bit of material in seeking to give you a window into how Dan Gibbons will seek to lead this college in the coming days, months, and years. So with that, we'll begin with some slides and talk to you about this leadership perspective. Where are we going? How are we seeking to get there? And what can you expect during the unexpected times as each of us seeks to understand where things are coming from? So with that, understand I'll begin by talking about our strategic plan for this college. Where are we headed? As we talk about that strategic plan, understand I want to recognize clearly that I am coming in as a dean who is following tremendous individuals who have preceded me as deans at this college. If we talk about Richard Talbot, the founding dean of the college, understand that if we talk about subsequent individuals, Peter Ayer, if we talk about Gerhard Schuring, if we talk about Cyril Clark, if we talk about Greg Daniel, each one of those individuals has worked diligently to advance this college. Understand, I want to specifically recognize the last two and a half years, Greg Daniel has done a tremendous job of providing servant leadership to this college, seeking to put together a really strong team. Understand that that Greg has done a tremendous job getting us to where we are. My goal is not just to sustain what has gone before us. My goal is to advance this college and to advance this college significantly as we head into future challenges and future opportunities. So with that, I want to recognize the work that has been done most recently on the strategic plan of this college. Coming in as a dean at this juncture, we've had significant work done regarding the strategic plan. Laura Hungerford, assisting Greg Daniel with the work of Aaron McCann, has worked in an iterative process with students, faculty, staff, alumni, and college partners so that we can develop the best college plan that we can moving forward. As we consider this situation, as we consider this strategic plan moving forward, there are five key pillars within that strategic plan. Understand that as we think about those five key pillars in the strategic plan, we are seeing that we can categorize, categorize those with the first pillar of the strategic plan being how we care for individuals within their own community. We as a college must, at this juncture in time, have a degree of focus on the wellness, the well-being, and the sense of community within this college. Second pillar, to enhance and optimize our educational programs. When we talk about the educational programs of this college, we're not just talking about the DVM program. We want to have a recognized, established, renowned DVM program. But we also have a program for a Bachelor of Science in Public Health, a Master of Public Health, 
the, the master's degree in biomedical sciences, the PhD in bio biomedical sciences. When we talk about enhancing and optimizing our educational programs, we're talking about all of those. The third pillar, promoting the discovery and scholarship within the college. We're talking about research, publication, application, dissemination of new, novel, impactful findings. We are to, to be a center that has a positive impact in establishing, developing, disseminating new knowledge. Fourth pillar, to provide advanced clinical services to our patients with compassion and care. So understand, this is, this is excellent, compassionate clinical service. Our fifth pillar is to advance One Health initiatives to improve the well-being for animals, people, and communities. We can summarize that as providing care, this holistic One Health care for other communities. You see, when we talk about where this college is going, this is a brief summary of the strategic plan that is about to be finalized. Within the next 60 days, we will have this strategic plan for the college finalized. This will clearly map out where we are headed. As we talk about this, I want to spend just a moment as we think about sense of community within this college. Because understand many of you all are familiar with the parable about the individuals whose sight might be somewhat obstructed as they make an assessment of an elephant. Understand that sometimes our sight is obstructed because we're working so diligently with something that's right in front of us. Many of you all know of this parable. You know of, of the analogies that can be created from it. But I want to focus on one particular analogy. When we think of Virginia Maryland College of Vet Medicine, you may be an individual stakeholder within this college who is working so close to some aspect of the college that when someone asks you, what is Virginia Maryland College of Vet Medicine, your response is, as you see on the slide, it's public health, or it's a graduate training program, or it's a training program for clinical veterinarians, or it's a biomedical research center, or it's a training program for public corporate veterinarians, or it's a state-of-the-art referral teaching hospital. Understand that my goal as we talk about a sense of community is that we all come to an understanding that we are one impressive entity. We are a group that has many different areas of the mission of this college that we focus on. Understand that it's critical that we can appreciate what others in this college are doing. I haven't been here long, but understand that we have uh, researchers who have stayed up all night in the last week trying to hit that deadline with the very best grant proposal that they can submit. Understand we have had clinicians who are dealing with real challenges associated with making sure they have all the appropriate biosecurity procedures for COVID-19, who are seeking to provide outstanding care for clinical cases coming into our teaching hospital. Understand that we have individuals in our, our public health arena who are advising the governor, the Department of Public Health, the university, who are a resource that I am receiving tremendous compliments on in all that they are doing. We have researchers who are working diligently and skillful in approaching the solutions that will help to end this pandemic. Understand, collectively, we have so very much to be proud of as a college. And we have to appreciate this aspect of we have a lot of different areas that we're working on. Sometimes to keep all of it in focus, is a little bit like seeking to stand on a beach ball as the tide comes in because we have so many different areas that are moving so rapidly to ad address the challenges in front of us. To see it all is a unique challenge. But our goal is to move this entire college forward with the strategic plan that is about to be finalized. 
So this is the goal. This is where we're headed to. One of the questions for a dean is, but how are you going to get there? How are you going to seek to lead this college toward the destination that is in front of you? So to address that question, allow me to share with you some of the means values, the means of how we are going to get to these ends. What are the things that Dan Givens values? What are the enduring beliefs regarding the concrete and operational actions through which we seek to achieve our goals? Let me share some of these with you from a personal standpoint, understanding that these will be discussed with the leadership team of the college in the days to come to see which of these values we all as a leadership team hold closely as a shared value so that we can move this college forward to the ends that are described in the strategic plan. Means value number one, decisions will be focused to pursue the optimal overall good of the college. I've already described to you the need to keep the entire elephant in focus, the overall good of the college. I probably need to connect with you a little bit as I seek to use this word optimal. Understand the words that we use are important and can result in understanding or misunderstanding. When I use the word optimal with you in this discussion, we're understanding that we have constraints. We have the constraints of time, resources, individuals. Within those constraints, what's the best we can do? Understand there's a point of diminishing returns. We're not using the word optimal to say that we're going to keep tweaking the PCR protocol so that we never run a diagnostic test with the PCR. Understand we've got so much time before we need to make an impact. So as I use the word optimal, please don't misunderstand and think they're gonna tweak that thing, they're never gonna get anything done. When I use the word optimal, Within the constraints that we're working on and working with, we're going to make the decisions that are in the best interest of the overall good of the college. So understand, what are these other values about how we get to the goal of this college? In no particular order, but in a very critical nature, a value of Dan Givens and a value that we will talk more about in this discussion is a clear understanding of the diversity of varying perspectives and voices which is critical to making thoughtful and optimal decisions for this college. Let, let me hold on that discussion for a second and we're going to come back to that. Next, means value. At all times and in all ways, I will seek to demonstrate respect for each individual and for the critical roles through which each of us advance the mission of this college. We have some tremendous individuals at this college with tremendous abilities. Some who have been serving this college for a long time with diligence, with care, my goal is to, at all times and in all ways, demonstrate great respect for each of those individuals as an individual, as a person, and also demonstrate respect for the role that they play in serving this college. I'm still getting to know many. An example would be Janet, who in the area of this college campus where the dean's office is, she helps to provide services to make sure that we are clean, we have a facility that will be impressive. She plays an important role in this college, as, as each of us do. My goal is to make this, to advance this, to sustain this as an outstanding college. For that to happen, we're all going to have to work together. I seek to demonstrate great respect for each individual. During my service in this role, I will seek to always consider and remember two critical factors. One is the mission of the college, where are we headed? And two is 
Each of us are individuals that make up this college. Valuing, respecting that individual person and valuing and respecting the mission for where this college is headed. Next means values. Sincere and focused effort will be made to clearly understand how things have been done in the past. Many of you all who may be listening to this have been involved with this college for many years. My goal, my commitment is to hit the ground listening, to develop an understanding of how things have been done in the past, because that's critical. That's who we are as a college. Simultaneously, I need to communicate as a value that I hold. I understand that new is not always improved and old is often not outdated. However, historical precedent will not be the sole determinant of how things should be done and will be done in the future. On this slide, you can see a picture. A lot of students having a great learning opportunity in a very confined space. Being very frank, we can't do that because of COVID-19 as we reopen in the fall. Things are gonna have to be different because pressures, circumstances surrounding us have changed. So understand that as we think about I want to learn how have we done things? How are we currently doing things? My goal is not to come in and introduce change for the sake of change. However, I do hold as a core value that historical precedent will not be the sole determinant of how things should be done in the future. As we talk about decision makings, at times, the dean of this college must make decisions that are not supported by everyone. In areas of previous responsibilities, as I worked with students, some of the students can recall me saying, one of my objectives was to make sure everyone was unequally happy, because if everyone was unequally happy, then in a previous role, I had done my job. I tell you a little bit of that narrative simply to say, I understand clearly, I as the dean, will make decisions that are not supported by everyone. During those times, I do desire to understand dissenting opinions. As I work with the leadership team here at Virginia Maryland College of Vet Medicine, as a team, we've got outstanding individuals on that team already. I'm excited to join that team. We're gonna be honest with each other. When we disagree, we want that out on the table and we want that clearly to be understood because only by understanding all of the opinions on the table can we make the best decisions possible. Regarding this process of decision making and the resulting decisions, communication of timely and specific feedback is valued. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is decisions are gonna be made that you don't agree with or that you don't support. I wanna encourage you to communicate that with your individual member on the leadership team of the college in a way that's both timely and specific. What did you not like? Why did you not like it? Communicate that in a timely way. Understand that in doing so, we will be able to receive feedback in the process to allow this college to advance most rapidly and most significantly. Next, decisions will be reviewed through various frames when seeking optimal outcomes. A decision has to be made. Four frames that we're gonna look at real quickly. We're gonna look at the logistical frame. What do I mean by that? As if this were uh, a factory, meaning we've got things that we need to, to produce. How are we doing at creating a logistical process to produce those things? Too symbolically, we are an institution of higher learning. We are a center for novel solutions to improve tomorrow. We should have an outstanding experience when someone visits the college. It should be uh, you are entering a place that you want to go home and tell people about, that symbolic aspect. Political, there are limited resources. How can we best position this college to obtain, manage, have resources when we're in an environment of limited resources? And also a human resource perspective. 
we want to further develop individuals within this college so that we have a stronger and stronger and stronger team of faculty, staff, students, partners, alumni of this college. Last means values that we'll talk about before we talk about application of these. Understand transparency in decisions and decision making is valued and will be fully pursued within the limits due to prudent confidentiality. Confidentiality will be ma maintained to demonstrate respect for individuals and individual situations. My hope is that uh, my time in this role as Dean will be characterized as he was very clear about what he was thinking, about the decisions that were made. He provided a degree of transparency that stopped at the appropriate spot when prudent confidentiality was a concern, but he also shared significantly in that process. So understand these are some of the, the core values regarding means that I have, that I'm gonna work with the leadership team on addressing. So now let's ask the question, because some of you all are thinking, this is all just talk. What's, what's he going to do? What's this college going to do under Dan Gibbons? Let's talk about some specifics. We are at a point in time where there's been the recent tragic deaths of Ahmed Arbery in Brunswick, Georgia, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, George Floyd in Minneapolis. Acts that are tragic, that should not and cannot be tolerated by a just society. This college has as part of our principles of community diversion, diversity, inclusion, and equity. We will not stand, we will not accept, we will not endure racism and hatred. We must act and take action on aspirations that are detailed in our university's principles of community. Those are affirming the inherent dignity and value of every single person. Affirming the right of each person to express thoughts and opinions freely affirming the value of human diversity which enriches our lives in rejecting, rejecting all forms of prejudice and discrimination. And we pledge our collective commitment and I pledge my individual commitment to these principles in the spirit that we may serve society. Critical, critical. And again, as I've worked with some individuals in the past week, there can be the feeling that, Dan Gibbons, that's great, but all you've done is, is simply utter words. What are we going to do as a college? I commit to you that working with the appropriate groups in this college, the curriculum committee, for instance, we will Number one, we will assess and improve what we have done and what we are doing in training students, onboarding faculty, and onboarding staff. It would be, it would be a significant error of a new dean if I did not recognize the work that has gone before us. Ed Monroe has been working on these issues for years in this college. He uh, a, diversity, a diversity committee within this college, they have spent lots of time and effort seeking to address these issues. They would express their disgust as what is, at what has recently happened in our nation. But I want to make sure I'm clear. 
I'm not the new kid on the block thinking that others have not gone before and done, done significant and meaningful work in this area. And they are simultaneously not pleased and not accepting of where we are today. This is an area where we will advance. We will assess and improve what we have done and are doing in training students, onboarding faculty, onboarding staff. We will enhance our college's culture and structure. I'm a firm believer that um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We can come up with new committees, we can come up with new structure, we can come up with new strategy. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. I will commit to you that we as a college will enhance our culture and structure to support the admission and the retention of black students. We will clearly and broadly communicate appropriate methods to address and report bias, discrimination, harassment, and violence. Many of those are already in place. I'm not here to say we need new structure. I am here to make sure we clearly and broadly communicate appropriate methods to address those issues. We will seek to be caring and supportive advocates that actively and empathetically listen. We will seek to be professional role models for diversity, inclusion, and equity in rejecting racism and hatred. One of the other areas where you can say how are you going to apply these means values has to do with COVID-19 biosecurity as operations expand. We have experts in this college who have spent a tremendous amount of time and effort developing protocols and procedures that will allow us to expand operations in teaching, research, and clinical service. Those expansions are already ha happening. Our teaching hospital here at the college is already doing significant work serving clients and patients in a safe way, in an effective way, and in, and in a compassionate way. Understand Laura Hungerford has done great work in this area. Understand that um, we have others, Jenny Hodgson, Jenny Zambrinsky, and Sarah Ahmed on the research side of things. All of these areas, Terry Swecker, have worked to develop appropriate protocols for COVID-19. We are at the stage of this point, they're already being implemented, okay? Teaching hospital, they're implemented. Research side of things, they are being implemented as we have a, a phase reopening of research that was not in that essential category initially. Understand that we're gonna have students coming to the, back to the college in the near future. We are at the stage now where we are going to be seeking to effectively communicate those protocols in those different areas of research, teaching, and service service, we've already implemented some of those. But the next step is to in essence have a, a college level COVID-19 response task force that can provide oversight and harmonization between these protocols for research, teaching, and service. Understand, we want to make it as easy as we can. And at the same time, we would be improperly managing your expectations if we said there will not be continued challenges as we appropriately deal with the biosecurity that must be in place for us to safely expand operations in our teaching hospital, in our research, as we bring students back. So our, our goal, our next step in this process is to have a college level task force that will harmonize all of the, the different situations that we see, research, teaching, service, and then we'll be ready to adapt 
because the thing we know is that this situation will change. Hopefully, the pandemic will be addressed and we will be able to emerge in a sequential fashion out of the precautions that we have in place. When will we emerge? When will we change those biosecurity procedures? Understand that this college level committee will be both efficient and effective in making those decisions under all of the guidance at the state level, at the AAVMC level, at the AVMA level, all of those are going to advise what we do. The university is going to advise what we do. And we will still have to make the decisions of exactly how do we do this thing under the advisement, under the regulations of all of these entities. College level committee will be able to do this both thoughtfully, effectively, communicating efficiently so that we can move forward in these unexpected times of addressing these issues. So let me, uh, at this juncture, create a little bit of a dialogue for us. If you would desire to submit a question, know that you can submit a question to CVM Dean, that C is in college, V is in veterinary, M, is meta, M as in medicine, CVM Dean at vt.edu. You can email a question into that email address cvmdean at vt.edu and we will take those questions and we will address those questions as we have time right here. So with that, allow me to address some of the questions that came in prior to us meeting here. Number one, how do you think we could turn social disparities highlighted by COVID-19 into strategies to create a stronger community at Virginia Maryland College of Vet Medicine? Understand that, that COVID-19 has hit uh, populations, individuals in, in different ways at different times. We have a, a subset of population who has they have lost jobs. Those groups have lost more lives because of COVID-19 than other groups. We can look at, at being very specific, African-American population, black population. They've lost more lives because of COVID-19 than other groups. They've lost more jobs because of the response to COVID-19 and other groups. So the question is a critical question. How can we look at this situation and seek to leverage the resources of this college in research, in teaching, in, in outreach to these groups that are disproportionately affected? As we think about that question, that's going to be answered best by each individual. Understand we've got a commitment that we will serve not just our own community but other communities well. We will look at the tools that we have for public health issues. How can groups that are in certain dynamics, certain pressures, certain situations best respond this is a systemic issue. This is not something where you can say, here's the easy answer to it. This is something where we can say, we have to begin by recognizing the problem. And then by recognizing the problem, we have to look at what are the resources that we have available and can be leveraged so that we can help to address the disparities that are recognized understand that we will do that as a college moving forward. We recognize the disparity. We will be asking the question, how can we leverage these resources for the good of all? Understanding, I do believe in the phrase, injustice for one is injustice for all. As we seek to create a better tomorrow, we have resources at this college that are available to help address these issues. How will we do that? 
that's where the individuals on the front lines, in public health, in specific research laboratories, in teaching, in the various different educational programs that we talked about, are going to be critical. A specific example that I will give you, if you're a young person out there who's tuned into this and, and you, you are black and African American, first of all, let me say to you, I'm sorry for what you're going through right now. I don't pretend that I can truly understand what you're going through. I do seek to listen well to you as you desire to discuss what you're going through. But understand, if you're thinking about public health as a career, I need to encourage you because we need individuals like yourself who can understand your community very well in public health to help address some of these issues. You have answers that I don't have. I understand you may be a young undergraduate student who's just thinking about public health. If you're that student, I want to encourage you to look at public health as an opportunity. This college's Bachelor of Science in Public Health, we need you in that. We need you helping to address these issues. So the overall global question of how will this college leverage our resources to address the disparities that we see, it's going to be an individual solution in each of the different areas that make up this large entity that we call Virginia Maryland College of Vet Medicine. So if we could go back to the slides for a second on questions. How can Air College support students that are struggling with being a learner during COVID-19? For example, due to lack of childcare, being isolated, inadequate internet access, screen time migraines. First of all, let me say to you that this is going to be a, a challenge going into the fall. We're going to seek to address these issues by having, we want to return to what we know is the most effective method of educating that is possible. That means we're going to seek to have interactions with students that are at times one-on-one -on -one in-person interactions because there are some things that we teach that are best taught working, manipulating, hands-on in person. At the same time, we realize fully that going into this fall, if I am honest, transparent, if I appropriately manage your expectations, you will understand coming back this fall, it's not going to be like it was before. You're going to have some situations where you're thinking, I'd rather be in a classroom listening to this lecture in person. And in some situations, we're just not going to be able to make that happen. Some of our educational interactions this fall will continue to be online. Yes, some will be in person. We're excited to have students back in some clinical settings. We're going to be excited to have some students back in some laboratory settings but we need to manage your expectations well. We're not at the juncture in responding to this pandemic where this fall we can tell you we're going to be back in person. It's going to be just like it was before. We are not there. I cannot have you walk into this fall with that expectation. But how can we address some of those things? You're going to find that our group here at the college as well as student services on main campus are going to work with each student carefully so that we can address your needs. That's a commitment. That's a commitment that Jenny Hodgson and Jackie Pelzer have demonstrated for years at this college. That's a commitment that we will continue to demonstrate. Care for each individual student will be based on that individual student's need. If you're a student that has migraines associated with looking at the computer screen, please make sure you talk to individuals in academic affairs so that they can seek to assist you. We're committed to that. We're committed to your success. I understand some colleges talk about retaining students. That's always caused me to bristle just a little bit. 
Our goal is not to retain a student. Our goal is to help you as a student flourish. That's our commitment. That's what we're going to seek to do. And we are going to continue to be frustrated somewhat this fall with the COVID-19 measures that are necessary. And despite all of that, we're going to do our very best to keep you both safe when we think about viral transmission and also to optimize your educational process with the resources that we have in place. I hope that you understand that answer to the question is going to be different for each student in each situation. I do need to encourage each of the students in each of our educational programs, if you need help, we need for you to communicate that need for help and to reach out. Because if you don't reach out and communicate that you need help in a timely manner before you get behind, before you're having real problems, if you don't communicate early on in the process, we're not going to be able to assist you individually in the way that you would desire and the way that we would desire. So as we go back to that next question, do you feel there's an issue with young faculty having a mass exodus from academia? If so, what ideas do you have for retention of these younger clinicians and researchers? Understand that the academic environment for a young faculty member can be very challenging. We as a college have to have both structure and culture in place where there's appropriate mentorship, where we can pair young faculty with more experienced faculty just to be able to discuss the frustrations. We also are not at a point where we should or can expect every faculty member to be what we call a triple threat, to be an outstanding educator in the classroom, uh, a, a researcher that is maintaining a constant stream of NIH funding, and also a clinician who's running uh, part of the teaching hospital in a way that has a, a robust caseload. We, we cannot and should not expect every faculty member to do that, and we don't. Understand that we need a culture and a strategy that mentors those individuals who would desire to stay in academia to stay here. We also don't need to uh, create a culture where if a young faculty member says, you know what, I, I would desire to go and get different experiences in different sectors of veterinary medicine. That's not a wrong choice. Understand we need to respect and we need to affirm each individual's desires for their career. And we simultaneously need to make being a faculty member at this college something that would be desired desired from the standpoint of the impact that we get to have on young minds as they develop in this wide breadth of careers in biomedical science, in public health, in veterinary medicine. We have what I consider to be a, a great joy of interacting with those students, of seeing the light bulbs go on and then seeing those students turn on light bulbs that we didn't even know existed as they advance their understanding to solve new problems in new ways. Understand that we need to assist that faculty member in research, in developing their career, such that they are creating, creating innovative solutions that can be commercialized and have an impact in broader entities other than just academia. Understand that when we think about the clinician, we need to create a, an environment at this college where a clinician can do outstanding, cutting, cutting edge, state of the art clinical care with great compassion for clients in a way that they both enjoy and understand they're passing that on to other students as those students are in the teaching hospital. So my answer to that question is, we have to demonstrate a certain joy in what we do. 
If I don't demonstrate a joy in what I'm doing each day, those around me will think, why doesn't he just quit? Part of what we have to do is say, where's the joy? What's the part of my job that I enjoy doing? How can I clearly communicate that to others so that they might want to join me and continue to join me in this process? So if you're a young faculty member out there, I do want to communicate to you sincerely. My goal is to make this college a place that not only you want to be, but you want to communicate with other individuals that you've worked with previously in internships or residencies or as a classmate in vet school that, hey, the place you want to be working is Virginia Maryland College of Vet Medicine. Because when we do that as a collective whole, we're going to see that, hey, we have the right people in the right places doing the right things. It's fun to be on a team that is both productive, is dynamic, is, is moving things forward in the process. So that's my hope, is that we can create both that culture and that structure at this college so that we have young faculty who are not only pleased to be here, but they are our best recruiters for recruiting other faculty to be here. So with that, I think we have just a little time for some additional questions. So some questions that are coming in right here. How will departmental funding be used to financially support public health research that aims to address racism and other complex social issues as a root issue of community disparities? How will departmental funding be used to financially support public health research that aims to address racism and other complex social issues as a root issue of community disparities. So as we seek to address complex social issues, we have to be careful in, in misunderstanding that complex social issue because of what I will call dissection, meaning we think we can cut the complex social issue apart into all of its components and then have research to address each of those components individually versus looking at this as a collective whole. Understand we do have individuals in this college, in the public health arena, who both have and are further developing their understanding for communities that have experienced the disparities that we're describing. I think there has to be a, some understanding that's developed by talking with people who are in the midst, in the middle, in the center of these complex social issues and then seeking to say, what are the resources that they think might be helpful in this situation and that others think might be helpful in the situation. I'm always somewhat skeptical of the individual that comes in from a distant land or a distant perspective to communicate, I'm here with, with a solution that will fix your problem. I think that we've got to use the resources that we have both to listen and to seek to propose solutions that individuals within this community that are experiencing the disparity think this might be an answer that I could get excited about and integrate into this whole thing. So understand as we talk about departmental funding, financially support public health research, we will financially seek to develop transparency in how we are handling research dollars coming in. Any discretionary research dollars that we have will be used to both sustain programs that might need bridge funding and also be used to look at individual departments and say within these departments, how can this discretionary research funding be used to appropriately leveraging capabilities with critical needs to address these issues. So understanding as we talk through this one, part of this is going to be 
a commitment to the financial transparency of how we handle things at the college level, how we get dollars back into some departments so that those departments can address issues where the needs are critical and the solutions are proposed by understanding this whole thing. So with that, understand that we've got a few more questions and just a little bit of time left. So know that I appreciate uh, you continuing with us here. Hello and welcome Dean Gibbons. Quick question for the town hall. Racial bias training for incoming students, faculty, and staff is great. How will this be implemented for current students, faculty, and staff in a community where racism has already been identified as an issue within the college? Understand that we will we will work to address this. We will work to have this be a part of the fabric of the college, not just with new incoming individuals, but with all of us. Understanding I've had the privilege to work with some really impactful educators who can cause us to ask the question, what's your implicit bias? All of us walk into the room with implicit bias. Our goal will be to help individuals existing within the college and certainly individuals that are onboarding and coming in to be able to, to answer the question, what are my implicit biases? As I, as I sit down at the table, what are the things that I am prone to do that are not professional? What are the things that I am prone to do that doesn't demonstrate the greatest respect for each individual at the table? How can I both see that in myself and seek to address that in a way that we will have the most thoughtful and meaningful and impactful solutions as we move forward seeking to do an outstanding job in teaching, research, outreach, clinical service? So the question is how? How are we going to do that? It's a good question. It's a question I'm very frankly going to need some, some additional time to answer most appropriately. Coming in, one of my goals is to listen well. I want to make sure I know what is it that we're already doing as a college. Because I do know some things are already being done. How can we improve those things so that they are more impactful, so that we have faculty, staff, students, who are currently at the college saying, you know what? I realize something I didn't realize about myself. I realize something about myself in the way others perceive my words and actions that has a negative consequence. I would desire to use those, use that new knowledge to improve my words and actions to have a more positive impact on those around me so that we can have a better college, a better profession, a better local community, and a better global community. So those are some of the goals that I have uh, as we move this college forward. We've talked about the strategic plans. We've talked about my means values. We've talked about my goal with working with the leadership team. So it's a privilege to be here with you. It's a privilege for the time that you've taken. Do hear me as I say, I look forward to opportunities to personally interact with you, uh, with your portion of this college, as I get to know more about the college, as I have both the privilege and the responsibility of leading this college in creating better solutions for tomorrow in these different areas. Thanks so much. Hope you all have a great rest of your day.